Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And, of course, it's the second week, so we are back to Cat Who Books. Um, so, The Cat Who Smelled a Rat. Uh, I will be honest with you, I'm not entirely certain where the rat is in this beyond, you know, the usual OU oh, rat sorts of hyperbole and insults and the like. Um, so, this particular book is heavily marked by uh, Quillerin's romance with Polly. I mean, Quill's romance with Polly has been a thing in a lot of these books, um, but he he pays a lot more attention to her in this book than in a lot of others. Um, the predominant plot line, or the predominant backdrop of this particular book is uh, a series of fires that seem to potentially either be arson or accidents, but basically it's, it's late fall, early winter, and they're coming up on the last days before the quote-unquote big one. That is, when the snow finally hits and the whole county just gets buried under feet and feet of snow. This has come up in previous books. Quillerin's first The Big One, where he gets snowed in and for three days uh, starts to develop cabin fever because, well, he had the plans at the time to you know, get some reading done, get some writing done, get some cleaning done, that uh, he discovered he had cabin fever because, after all, there is a tremendous difference between choosing to stay in and finding yourself trapped in your house with no way out. Um, anyhow, so they're particularly praying for the big one this year because of all of these fires. And... Early in this book, uh, what happens after one of, after uh, several places nearly burned down and after Eddington Smith, you remember Eddington Smith, lovely little man, ran the used bookshop, um, even saved Quillerin one time with a handgun. Eddington Smith dies and he has in fact left his bookshop to Quill and then Practically days after Eddington dies, the bookshop burns down. Luckily, Eddington's cat Winston Churchill gets out, and we all know that's the most important thing in all of this. Um, and I'm not even being ironic by saying that. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's horrifying to Quillerin, who is not a bibliophile, but a logophile. You know, he loves words, he loves the written word and burning book and having that many books get burned whether due to arson or not is horrifying to him i mean you know it's it's not the same as somebody setting out to burn all the copies of something they think is horrible it's just a tragic tragic uh not precisely accident but incident um but you know, those of us who love books are always sad when we hear about things like bookstores burning down. Uh, so, it's with this backdrop of a lot of fires um, that, they, that people spend the whole book just wanting the snow to come because, of course, as soon as everything is under feet of snow, an arson attempts of all of these things will finally stop. There's a lot of talk in this book about XYZ Enterprises. XYZ Enterprises um, being the building concern that built incredibly shoddy buildings and ran incredibly shoddy uh, marketing and building enterprises uh, finally breaks up in this book. And Don Exbridge, who is the X of XYZ, um, writes smarmy, writes an incredibly smarmy letter to the editor 
about how shaft houses are their are their history and need to be preserved. And everyone knows that he's being smarmy, and then he follows this up by writing in a bunch of angry letters that Quillerin, having had some practice as a kid at pretending to be other people in writing letters, he and Arch relate um, a an interesting story about uh, that he relates an interesting story about when he and Arch were kids, and saw an interview with a baseball player who had complained that he wasn't getting any fan mail while everyone else on the team was, and so Quill had taken it upon himself to write a whole bunch of letters purporting to be by different people to this guy. And, uh, you know, and let's be honest, that's kind of a good deed for a kid who also frequently glued his teacher's seat to the cushion on her chair. Um, Quillerin was apparently a prankster. Anyways, uh, so it's, it's in that particular backdrop of hoping for snow and constant fires and starting up a, a, uh, and somebody organizing a fire watch, sort of a volunteer fire watch where basically people drive around on the back roads and watch out for fires so that word can be gotten to the, uh, to the fire department much more quickly. Um, and a lot in this book is about endings of things. There's a whole scene of the, of elderly people together talking about sounds that have gone by the wayside that you never hear anymore. Uh, some of them are the shoe shine for a nickel, which, you know, you'll never hear that anymore. But some of it is things like whole rooms of typewriters clacking away because, of course, people don't use typewriters anymore. They weren't using typewriters anymore by 2001, which is the year of publication of this book. Um, there's a mural in the post office, which they wind up uh, basically, it turns out that based on the kinds of materials used in it and when it was made, that this mural, which is one of the pride and joys of Pickaxe City, is actually a hazard and is going to have to be taken down. And, you know, and people are protesting that. It's about the ending of XYZ Enterprises as Don Exbridge strikes out on his own as his second wife divorces him because... He's a horrible person. As uh, Dr. Zoller, who was the Z in XYZ Enterprises, um, goes ahead and finally uh, hands over proof to the authorities that we find this out at the end of the book of Exbridge's um, misdemeanors, as, as well as the misdemeanors of the man who has been mayor in pickaxe for years. Um... And Cass Young, who is the Y in XYZ Enterprises, poor man, is uh, one of the people who who dies in the course of this. And at the end of this book, there's there's a lot of endings. There's a lot of people who who are ending things and leaving things behind. And and it's it's an undertone in this book. Um, and I think it may be, it may presage slightly something that happens a few books from now. I don't know for sure, because, um, it's always hard to tell with a series that's this long running over this many years, how many of these things are actually things that Lillian Jackson Braun had planned. Because I'm not entirely certain how many of these things she had planned back in the 60s when she first started writing these. Um, we get another resurgence of Quill's, you know, that weird set of things where on the one hand, Quill's mustache is psychic, on the other hand, he refuses to believe in horoscopes. Um, and in point of fact, he gets his horoscope done, um, anonymously, 
by the much overused pseudonym Ronald Frobnitz. That Ronald Frobnitz is actually a pseudonym he's used rather a lot in this series, over and over again, and I begin to wonder, in that way that one speculates about alternate universes in fictional worlds, that way that you speculate about the side effect, because uh, two books ago he bought something under the name of Ronald Frobnitz. He's constantly phoning people, trying to find out who lives in a particular place or doesn't live in a particular place using the name of Ronald Frobnitz. He has phoned around town pretending to be looking for Ronald Frobnitz. He's always saying, my third cousin twice removed, Ronald Frobnitz. And frankly, um, it makes you wonder a little bit in this series whether or not at some point long after Quillerin's dead, Somebody is going to go digging and try to find who this Ronald Frobnitz was, who everybody has heard of, and half the town has talked to, and nobody knows who he is or where he's from, but clearly he was something because everyone remembers talking to him. Um, really, I, I am amazed that it hasn't come back yet, and, um, it's one of those things where you start to wonder whether or not, as I said, Decades into the future, people are going to put up a memorial to Ronald Frobnitz, who bet against Quillerin in a great many silent auctions and, and, and phoned a great many people and offered his condolences to a great many grieving families. Um, and so... The thing in this... The, the other big thing in this one, of course, is that at the end of the last book in the series, uh, we were introduced to the character of Kurt Nightingale, who claims to have been a local boy, but nobody remembers anyone with the name of Nightingale, which had tipped Quillerin off that it was a fake name. And then, uh, at the start of the book, uh, Quill gets a present from uh, Polly. Well, what happened was, Kurt Nightingale gave Polly a gift of a glove box, and Polly, who felt that it didn't fit with anything in her decor and didn't want to keep it, but also didn't want Kurt to, you know, be insulted by the fact that she'd regifted it, promptly handed it along to Quill, who, it's a glove box, he used it to store gloves in it, um, but at the end of the book, uh, or coming up on the end of the book, Coco gets a little bit obsessive about it, um, I mean, he's been vaguely obsessive about it through the whole book, but by the end of it, he gets emphatic, and Quillerin finds out that there is a secret compartment in it and pulls out a letter, which is how he figures out that Kurt, um, what Kurt's real name is and uh, at least part of what Kurt was doing there. Um, so Coco actually does help solve this case for one, for uh, once, a lot of these cases in the later books, his, his, Coco's hints are a lot less blatant than they once were, and they're a lot more sideways than they once were, so this particular one, this is a much more solid hint, and it's much more of a pointing directly actually at things. Um, so... I'll admit, this is, uh, this is one of the ones which is, it's, it's a lot lighter. There's, there are two deaths, but they're not wrenching deaths. We don't get to know Cass, and we don't find ourselves, you know, doing the he only had two days to retirement thing. We don't feel a sort of a horrifying, painful irony in it. There is some. Cass's mother had just moved up north, and then he dies right as she's done it, and right before he's about to start a whole new career path. But it lacks some of the poignancy of of some of the uh, of some of the earlier murders in this series. Um, so I don't have a whole lot left to say about this book, so I'm going to end it here, and I will see all of you all one of you listening to this next week.